Hello, my name is Greg Osborne, and I'm with the SPE Mold Technologies Division, and I'm here with uh, Jerry from Alliance Specialties, and uh, today we're going to be talking about misdiagnosed electrical issues with your hot runner systems. A few months ago, I got with Jerry, and uh, we talked about some of the issues that uh, we see with hot runner systems, and a lot of people automatically think they have a poor heater in their hot runner system when things aren't working correctly. So I'm talking to Jerry, and we talked about the things that uh, can be a common problem and thermal couples seem to keep coming up in our conversation. So the majority of our talk will be on thermal couples. And uh, Jerry, do you want to explain how a thermal couple works? Um, the thermal couples sense the heat from the end. Most systems in uh, most systems in the United States run on a grounded system. So it's the end of the thermocouple that actually projects all the heat and brings it back to the controller, telling the controller to put more heat out or retard heat. The problem with the thermocouple is it is so small and it is so thin that any little pinch in the thermocouple can cause it to misread. That's a good point, Jerry. Another, another thing people think is they can actually check the resistance of thermocouples in the system and that they should all measure the same, and that, and that is not the case, is it, Jerry? No, it isn't. Um, different lengths and different wires will give you different resistance as they go through. Um, these two thermocouples are exactly the same, and they will tell the controller the same thing from the very end up here. But the length of it, if you took a meter and metered it, would give you a different resistance for the whole thermocouple. And people think that the one is shorter, it doesn't have the resistance of the other one, so it's no good. That's a good point. The, the other thing we talked about is the different types of thermocouples that are sold here in the U.S. And, uh, you know, being a global market, we can get thermocouples from around the world. And you know they all have different readings. We have a type J and a type K. And typically in North America, we see the international standard, which is black and white. And we also see the USA standard, which is red and white. Jerry, do you want to tell us how we can tell the difference between a positive and negative the wire? The difference on the wiring is one is ferrous where it's magnet magnetized. That's your positive, no matter what color it is. That's your positive leg. The other one is just a general neutral, I would call it, that would go down through. And um, the neutral hooks up to the other post. That is your main way of going over and telling the difference between thermocouples. That's a great point. The other issue we saw with thermocouples was the way that they're assembled. The assembly for the thermocouple is very important. If the thermocouple isn't hitting the bottom of the steel, it's not measuring the correct temperature. Jerry, do you want to explain that a little bit further? Uh, the end point on the thermocouple is where it reads from. If your hole is deeper and it doesn't go all the way down, you're reading air. Uh, the air might be a different temperature you could be off as much as 10 to 20 degrees on your heater just because it's not reading actual metal temperature. And, and in a multi-cavity system, that makes a big difference. If you've got 16 drops in a system, and one of those thermocouples, like Jerry said, is just you know, 10 thousandths away from the steel, it will react differently in that multi-cavity system. It actually cause a lot of problems. Jerry and I talked about this at length, and it's one of the hardest things to find because, you know, only ten thousandths of a difference between touching and not touching can create problems when you're molding. Another problem with thermocouples is, as Jerry mentioned, it's the end of the thermocouple that is actually getting the temperature measurement. The problem is, inside of a mold, those wires can become pinched and now we have a new temperature reading point. Jerry, do you want to explain that a little bit further? Yeah. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've gone over and done a mold that went in, had run thousands of parts, millions of parts probably, and had never had a problem. We went over and 
cleaned the manifold for a maintenance, gave it back to the customer, the customer put it together, and now all of a sudden one side of the tool was not running properly. They were getting shorts on it, they weren't getting the same flow rate. We ended up finding out that they pinched a wire farther back on the tool and the whole drop wasn't heating correctly. So by the time the manifold turned around and got the plastic from the manifold to the tip, it had dropped in temperature and started solidifying so that it wouldn't turn around and flow as evenly as the other side did. It became a big issue. We ended up cleaning it again and checking it again just to find out it was a thermocouple problem. And, and that's a good point. We actually have an example that Jerry had in house the other day when uh, we did our presentation pre-talk. And in this thermocouple here, you can see a few different pinch points from the tip. So in this case here, we were actually reading back towards the middle of the thermocouple probe and not at the tip. We also talked about a different ways that you could actually test that. And one of the ways you can test that is you know, using hot water or something of that nature. And, and here's a, uh, a little tip for a pinch point test. You can actually put your thermocouple into a cup of boiling water or, or hot you know, substance like that. And if it reads instantly when you put the tip in the water, then the thermocouple is not pinched. If you keep inserting that probe in there, when it hits the pinch point, that's when it'll see the dramatic temperature increase. The other problem we talked about with hot runner systems inside of the hot manifold itself is that you have a lot of different heat sinks in that manifold. So it's not always a heater that's causing a problem. You could actually have too much contact on that hot runner system and it's actually dissipating, pulling the heat away from that manifold in the steel plates. Jerry, do you want to explain that one a little bit more? Um, usually on the back of every manifold, opposite the drop, there is a pad that goes over and keeps pressure on the system itself. That pad usually can be made out of titanium or cut correctly so that the heat isn't drawn up through it and turn around and transferred into the manifold itself or the mold base itself, drawing the heat away from there. That heat sink that's drawn away makes the thermocouple work harder makes the manifold work harder, makes the drop work harder. All the heaters have to work extra hard because they're actually heating areas that are not supposed to be heated. I think one of the biggest things that we see in this case where you've got, you know, maybe P20 steel as a manifold support and it's actually dissipating that heat away from the manifold so the manifold is working, like Jerry said, extra hard. We'll get a lot of calls that, uh, you know, the customer thinks that are heater doesn't have enough wattage or voltage, right? So they think you need a bigger heater, you need a bigger heater. But the problem is not the heater itself, it's actually the supports that they're using. Right. Another uh, point of you know concern a lot is the tip contact. And sometimes the material differences can change the amount of tip contact you need, right, Jerry? Right. You can use uh, beryllium copper if there are other, a lot of uh, companies have gotten into carbide tips and everything else. So different tips will draw off or dissipate heat faster than others. So you have to be careful with the tip type. And each company turns around, I know DME does, they have multiple grades of tips that you can turn around and get to turn around and put into the system to go over and regulate your heat. Yes, that's correct. Another, another thing is the plastic material itself, right? So let's say they built a manifold and it was specced out for a polypropylene material. That would require more of a tip contact on the cavity block to control the gate. If they switch to a nylon material that runs at a higher temperature, they're going to have to reduce that tip contact. And right. that's something to keep in mind as well, right? Right. Jerry and I were talking about this one as well. So you've got a brand new manifold, right? And you're at sampling, you've got the prints for it, right? Jerry doesn't have that luxury all the time, right? Because his he gets 20-year-old manifold systems that are in ill repair. There are no prints for it. 
and he's trying to determine, you know, what is the wattage of this, what's the resistance of this heater supposed to be? Well, one of the formulas you can use is you can take the voltage squared divided by the watts, and that'll give your ohms resistance. I've got a sample manifold heater here, and on most heaters, the voltage and wattage is listed on there. So in this case here, we had a 230 volt heater, 960 watts. When you do the math, it turned into a 55 resistance, ohms resistance. So we could verify this heater is good or not by just looking at the uh, stampings on the heater and then doing the, uh, the arithmetic there. Uh, one of the other things that we forgot to get into a little bit were the plugs. Uh, most of the plugs, your contact wires and everything else are in a pin. Different companies use different plugs at different times. Some of them are pushed in, some of them are screwed in from the outside for connections and everything else. The biggest thing that we've seen is They'll go over and put pins together with their uh, wire sets. They go over and push a pin back or push a pin off to the side where they're not making good contact. And it's just like plugging in a plug on an outlet and not having both prongs into the plug all the way. It's going to get hot. It's going to come up to a certain temperature, but then it's not going to draw all the way. That's correct. Another, another thing we didn't touch on that we should have is splicing thermocouple wires, right? So we talked about pinching a wire in the system itself and then adding new wire to the length of that. And a lot of people are in the misconception that you can just grab the similar gauge wire and splice your wires, but you actually need to maintain those same uh, ferrous, non-ferrous connections, right? Right. You're almost better just trimming them back on both ends, stripping them back and using the original wire. That saves you from getting a different size gauge of wire coming back to the plug, which can affect your reading it immensely. Yeah, that's correct. In, in my service bag, I always kept extra wire in case I needed to splice wires in the field. We appreciate your time today. We hope uh, we helped uh, settle some of the misconceptions with uh, misdiagnosed electrical issues in hot runner systems. Thank you. Thank you very much.